Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Small Biz Matters. I was just experiencing some technical difficulties of my own. You're here with Alexi Boyd here for your weekly intake of Small Biz News. And we're going on a little bit of a different path today. We're doing uh, the politics thing, which I'm super excited about. Um, thank you very much for bringing, uh, sorry, thank you very much for joining us in the studio this morning, Emma Heidi. Thanks, Alexi. Um, Emma is the uh, Greens federal candidate for Barara. And we, those of you who haven't been living in a box, we are actually coming up to a federal election. What's that date? It is the 2nd of July. 2nd Alexi. of July, Saturday. that's right. Now, anybody who's involved in school stuff, like I am, will know that that's a very important fundraising day for schools. So those of you who haven't already volunteered to get yourselves on a barbecue and a cake stall, please join us and help raise some money for your school because that's a very important day. And I just wanted to bring up a little point here that I've uh, I've been it's been quirking me for the last couple of years, which is... Um, Advanced voting, uh, federal postal vote, that's becoming really popular, isn't it? It's very popular. It is. And I think it's a real shame because for me, the whole converging onto a school thing, buying your sausage sizzle, going to the cake stall, it's a bit of a community event and it's a very important fundraiser for school. So I'm just going to jump down off my soapbox and allow you to get on your soapbox in just a moment. But for those of you who are thinking about voting in advance, please don't because it's a really valuable fundraiser for schools and it's nice to you know, drop in, chat to your local community members, chat to your, you know, school, uh, you know, talk to people in your local community instead of, you know, avoiding that, which is essentially what most people try and do. (laughs) Um, So I'm really excited to have Emma on the show today. We're going to be talking about a number of political issues, some of which do relate to small businesses, which is what we're all about here on Small Biz Matters, but also um, the greater context issues that generally do impact on on business as a whole. Um, We're going to touch on a few environmental things. We're going to touch on a few um, community um, issues, especially here in in the area around Barara Electorate. Uh, And we're very thrilled to to welcome Emma to the show. So Emma, could you just take me a little bit, take us back a little bit. What what brought you into politics and what brought you to the Greens Party? Yeah, Alexi, that's a really good question. I I haven't always wanted to be a politician. uh, but I have always been in, uh, interested in politics because, like a lot of Australians, I know that um, that's who's making the decisions that um, really have an impact on my life and my family's life. So I've always followed politics really closely. But I think um, the turning point for me was when I had kids and um, I've got a couple of kids. They're um, 11 and 13 now. And um, I used to watch Bob Brown talking on the television and, and he made a lot of sense. He wasn't in it for himself. He wasn't in the game to um, further his own, you know, political ambitions or get himself on TV. Um, but he he told it like it was. And I found myself um, sitting in front of the television doing a lot of nodding. Um, and then over time I thought, yeah, well, you could just do more than a nod um, mm. and listen. You could actually decide to join in. So I joined the Greens um, and I, I thought, look, I'll do it for a year, um, see what it's like. And I found uh, a lot of very impressive people who really uh, walk the walk as well as talking the talk. And so I, um, I've, I've stayed with the Greens. Um, I admire um, the Greens politicians tremendously. And I, I really, the, the philosophies of the Greens, are economic and social justice, environmental sustainability, peace and nonviolence and, and grassroots democracy, they, they're really important values to me. So um, yeah, that's, that's why I became involved in politics. And that, I would say that, that that's that aligns a lot with the the, the policies and, and the belief system that it is around a lot of people around here in uh, in the Hornsby electorate as well, the Hornsby Barara area, because a lot of people believe that grassroots democracy is very important. And I would say um, I'm proud to be part of an area that thinks that every vote counts and that it's it's valuable what it is that we do and, and the contribution that we make. So um, and, and have you lived in, in the area for a long time? Yeah, I've lived in the area for about 20 years now. So, um, yeah. I came here without kids and, and now I'm um, raising my family here and absolutely love it. It's uh, it's accessible to the city. Uh, it's it's quiet. It's um, beautiful neighbourhoods with friendly people. And there's still that community feel. Um, it, each little community is different. Uh, Mount Kohler is different from Mount Karingo, which is different from Hornsby, which is different from Beecroft. Um, they've all, all got passionate people who um, care about their communities and get involved. So, yeah. And having been here, to live. Having, having been here for so long, how do you feel that the, the changing face of, of Hornsby and, and the Barara area is, is, is affecting local policy and local politics? I, 
um, I think it makes a lot of sense to um, to develop brown trains li- train lines while, like we're seeing and I know that there's some considerable anxiety about that and I think that's because not not because we're a bunch of NIMBYs here and we say, you know, um, not here, thank you very much, we're happy as we are, but because we've had no say in it. I think, as you say, uh, democracy is really important and, and we've just seen a set federal uh, state government sack a local government and so we have effectively no local say at all. And even before that, um, the state government made sure legislation was in place so that we really didn't have a whole lot of say over these really, really significant developments we're seeing in our area. So I think people are rightly concerned about it and um, feel that they haven't had a say and um, that they deserve one. And in terms of that, that, that population growth and the population movement, you've seen, if, with, with having lived here for 20 years, the development and the changes, what sort of an impact do you think that's going to have with that sudden explosion? Because it will be a sudden explosion. We're talking about, I mean, I lived in Asquith for uh, about five years and we're looking at the influx of around 1,200 families into the area within two years. So what sort of changes do you think foreseeable changes can you see that uh, have have sort of having with the the local community and also with local politics yeah it's going to have a um, a very big impact on uh, infrastructure because we've seen um developers allowed to uh, let rip wherever they'd like to uh, but we haven't seen the associated calls for um, more infrastructure from government so developers really put up the uh, units and flog them off at very high prices but they don't pay for um, any uh, more green space they don't set aside community areas uh, community halls meeting spaces uh, and nor do they provide um, any funds for additional schools or hospitals so um, as you say 1200 more families in Asquith but um, is the assumption that those people will not have children I <laughs> Perhaps that is the <laughs> assumption of the the local, state and federal governments because we haven't seen any more talk of increasing schools and teachers. That's right. So we are talking about something that's quite a local issue and you, of course, are a, the federal candidate. What impact does a federal candidate um, and the Greens Party at a federal level have an, on, on local issues? Because I think... For everyone here, and, and it's interesting that you mentioned the, the lack, let's just face it, the lack of democracy. We've had democracy taken away from us at a local level for the next 18 months while the um, the council is no longer in their positions. Uh, what trickle-down effect can any federal policy have on a local level? Or are we talking holistically about the Greens party and how they want to see things change on federal, state and local level? Look, the Greens have consistent policies at local, state and federal level, so you're absolutely right. Um, The Greens um, speak up for um, uh, what we believe in at every level of of engagement. But... um, for example, local councils is very much a federal issue. In Bradfield, which is uh, the North Shore seat of um, Paul Fletcher, um, we've got um, him as local government minister. And so it's it, local government and local concerns are very much a federal issue as well. Um, the Greens are pushing, for example, to have um, local government recognised in the constitution so that never again can local government be the plaything of a state government where, uh, and we see the situation repeated where a state government can just extinguish our right to have a say at local level. Because this isn't the first time that it's happened. We've also had this, uh, this has happened in, in Queensland and, and in some cases they had to roll back those changes. So are you suggesting that a policy change with regards to local government um, in the constitution would actually mean that states would be unable to make the changes that have just happened in New South Wales. That's exactly right. I think people feel that local government is incredibly important. They're, those representatives are our closest um, closest government link and we rely on them for more than just our roads, rates and rubbish. Um, they represent us in a, a, our communities and our voice and our values at a very, very local level. Those people know our communities, they're from our communities and they're terribly important. So yeah, if, uh, recognising local government in the constitution is, is a real step forward and that's what the Greens will be pushing really, really hard for. Interesting. Um, Just talking about another local issue, which um, my listeners will know on Small Biz Matters that I'm very passionate about, which is uh, TAFE. Now, we are talking a little bit more about the impact on those funding cuts specifically on the local business community. Uh, The small business community around here relies quite heavily on TAFE producing um, excellent, well-resourced, well-educated trainees and and apprentices to come out of that system. Uh, What we're finding is a huge decrease in the number of attendees, number of people enrolling in those courses, simply because, for example, the course fees have gone up fivefold. And I am citing a specific example where I did my bookkeeping course two years ago. Uh, sorry, not two years ago, three years ago now. It was $500. That exact same course is now valued at $2,500, which is 
laughable. That's a, that's a pretty increase, big increase in inflation. Now, there has been some federal policies which have impacted at a local level on our Hornsby TAFE, and that will be the... Uh, the, you know, the, the funding, the federal funding of those private institutions. Um, talk me through that process and what the Greens uh, say is, is on that moving forward. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. TAFE is absolutely essential to um, to innovation and small business and it's just extraordinary that we've got um, a federal government that talks about us being agile and innovative and meanwhile it's seeing um, the, the overseeing the the ripping the guts out of our, our TAFE system. And TAFE, as you say, provides um, skills for um, young people and mature people and everyone else in between um, that wants to skill up and get active and start contributing. I mean, why wouldn't we want to support people who, who want to um, get the smarts, get the experience, get the know-how and get out there and, and start um, setting up their own small business or contributing um, to a non-profit or um, joining government and making a difference there? It, it defies belief that we don't want to invest in our own future by looking after our, our kids and our young people when they want to go to TAFE. But couldn't it be argued that the federal funding is indeed looking after the future because it's making the tertiary sector more competitive, it's in, injecting funds into the private sector, therefore the TAFE sector is, is forced to to lift its game, if you will, um, to bring itself in line with the private sector and therefore be more competitive and, and also be more cost efficient? No, competition unfortunately doesn't necessarily um, equal um, more effective use of, of government money and taxpayers' money um, in education. There's ample evidence that TAFE was doing a fantastic job and it wasn't because of any inefficiencies in TAFE that um, state and federal governments made the decisions to, to basically gut it. It was an ideological one. The uh, agenda of a Liberal government is to outsource, to um, get rid of public institutions, to sell off assets, to privatise wherever possible. And so it's true to form that they would have put um, millions of dollars into private institutions. But what we've seen is an, a wrought on an unbelievable scale. We've seen institutions um, who've fly by nighters set up um, shop fronts with um, fancy banners and start giving away iPads. And meanwhile, they're providing um, substandard courses and um, mass receiving massive government subsidies for doing so. And I mean, this has been catalogued and it's not just one or two examples. It's hundreds and hundreds of examples of across the country of this major rotting taking place. So no, the public have been losers in all of this. Um, our taxpayer dollars have been, um, have been used to subsidise a, a rot, basically. And, and, and in terms of, uh, you, you mentioned their innovation and talking about innovation, um, if we were to trickle it down to the, the Hornsby level here, uh, what sort of um, federal policies could impact on any innovative businesses in this area, for example? I'd, I'd love to see some sort of injection of funds into, again, the education system. We've got the great Hornsby Community College. We've got Hornsby TAFE. It would be really wonderful to see an injection of funds to get innovation up and running. Um, if we look at business in the Hornsby area, we've got home-based businesses, we've got micro-businesses, we've got consultants working from home. We've got a broad range here. We've got that base to build on. What would you like to see the federal government do more with regards to funding for, for innovation at the local community business level? The Greens are 100% behind social entrepreneurs and business entrepreneurs and small business in general because we know that they provide half of all jobs and they generally tend to be far more innovative than big business, far more agile and innovative and far more um, able to, to generate new employment. So um, supporting small business and entrepreneurs is absolutely essential. Um, and to do that, the Greens will um, institute a uh, innovation commissioner who can then um, develop a national innovation strategy to start to address the sort of things you're raising, um, to start to look at how we can, at a local level, support people who, who've got a great idea and who need the capital to, to um, commercialise that idea. And I mean, one of the first things we do is reverse the um, the massive cuts that the government, uh, federal government, made to the entrepreneurs' infrastructure program. They've um, t removed three hundred and seventy-seven million dollars out of that program, and that's one of the first steps the Greens would take to um, to put that money back in, so we can start um, supporting our entrepreneurs in in all fields of endeavour. Talk me through that innovation commissioner. I haven't heard that expression uh, talked about before. Is there another comp comp comparable 
commissioner in place at the moment at the federal level that, that we can get our heads around who is that com- comparable to is that like the fair work commissioner is it someone who just oversees all of innovation across all sectors and that sort of thing we have no strategy for innovation at all at the moment um we or, talk about it a lot though. we talk about it a lot it's a great word that's it bandied is, around the place it is it's a very popular word but we don't see a whole lot of um planning or strategy behind it um so we have a yeah a prime minister who's very fond of the term but um who doesn't actually come up with any of the detail to support um, his big words. So, uh, yeah, an innovation um, commissioner would have a strategy for very, very practical programs at um, local, state and federal level that would address some um, the concerns that entrepreneurs are facing at the moment. Look, that, it's, it's an interesting topic, actually, innovation and, and science and technology. Um, that's obviously all wrapped up with another subject that we're going to talk about after the break in regards to uh, climate change and the impact that that's going to have on small business. You are listening to Small Biz Matters here on Triple H 100.1 FM. We'll be back after these short sponsorship announcements. So um, let's return back to our show. We are talking to Emma Heidi, who is the Greens candidate for the seat of Barara. Just before the break, we were talking a little bit about the impact on federal policy that it has on our, our wonderful institution of TAFE and a little bit about the local community and changes. You can, of course, listen to Small Biz Matters podcasts if you missed the show via the website smallbizmatters.com.au. So before the break, we were talking about, uh, we started talking about science and innovation. Now, just, just talk me through a very innovative, important topic, which I think is the number one the number one issue for small business or any business in Australia, which is the NBN. And my, listener, my listeners in Hornsby will go, the what? The what? We haven't got it. What is, what is that? What is that magical word called the ABN? Because we don't actually have the NBN in, in Hornsby, which I would have thought, hey, it can't be that hard to get something to Hornsby. We're not in, you know, Moree or the middle of, of New South Wales. So that's a really important issue for small business. What, what is the Greens' take on that and what sort of pressure can they put on the federal government to get something happening? Yeah, the National Broadband Network is absolutely essential infrastructure for small business. It's it's the highway to the future, basically. And what we've seen up is seen from the government is just delays and cost blowouts and, and secrecy surrounding the whole thing. Like you say, what is the National Broadband Network? Where is it? Why it seems, isn't it here? Yet? It seems to have completely fallen off the agenda when it comes to the federal election and. I don't hear any any business groups or, or the New South Wales Chamber of Commerce. I don't I didn't hear any business groups jumping up and down going, "Hello, this is really important that we get this happening now, not not in 4 years, 5 years or whenever it's going to kick in, but 2 years ago so we can bring ourselves up to the same speed what the world was 2 years ago, let alone, you know, even getting halfway there." Yeah, I know. Talking overseas, you look at a country country like Estonia and um, they are renowned for um, IT um, investment and it's it's doing their economy um, huge favours and and we're way behind them. So what's what's slowing us down? What is it? What's that? What's that elephant in the room that the government's not talking about? Obviously, there's no telecommunications companies who are lobbying against it happening. So what's the slowdown? What's taking so long? Yeah, well, look, to some extent, Alexi, we we don't know. And that's because the government have veiled this whole project in secrecy. They've actually exempted it from the Freedom of Information Act. So journalists can't find out um, the nitty gritty about um, the economics and the politics of the NBN. So um, we're all um, in the dark to some extent on this one. Can politicians find out about information or and then they've just basically got a gag order so you you could you could know about what's going on you just can't talk about it. Look what we do know is that Hornsby this area Barara won't get any um any kind of NBN access till 2018 and like <gasps> you say we're not I I was lied to. I was told a year ago that we would have it in 18 months by our lovely state fit, state member Matt Keane. So I'll be pulling him up at the 18 month mark going with my NBN. Yeah, I think you should. I think you should because, as you say, it's it's the biggest um, block for small business actually um, increasing and, and developing and being able to be as entrepreneurial as, as people want to be. It's, um, you know, we seem to find uh, massive amounts of money for roads. For example, we've seen the um, huge North Connects project um, popping up here, there and everywhere. And... Um, uh, 
and you just look at that and think, okay, it will save 15 minutes travel time and a couple of sets of traffic lights. But um, well, it will you know, have a huge, traffic. It will have a huge impact on on the lack of, on the pollution and, and the local people who live locally. Though. Yes, it that certainly will make it a whole lot worse. Yeah, it's absolutely disastrous because it'll get more trucks on the road. But um, aside from that, you know, my point is that um, we we seem to find a lot of money for those projects, um, billions and billions, and yet we can't seem to roll out essential infrastructure that would enable our business people to to get on with um, getting on with the future. Basically, um, look. Infrastructure is expensive to build, um, but I think we've seen a coalition government um, really take a what was going to be a, a fine and um, and future fit project uh, of fibre to the home, um, where fibre was going to extend two people's literally to a box on your wall, um, and now we've got a sort of hybrid um, model where uh, some of the copper is replaced by fibre, but um, copper, the existing old and um, decaying copper infrastructure is relied on to get um, from the node to the home. Um, so basically what I think we are seeing is that um, this is a sort of stopgap measure, a, a, the cheap option, the um, the substandard option, uh, which is going to sort of help us limp along for a few more years, but um, it's certainly not the um, the the best uh, quality um, NBN that we were promised um, several years ago now. So, so the the Labor's take on the NBN was correct, and and the Liberals was wrong. Yeah, look, I um, I think to some extent you're right. Um, the vision of having a fibre to the home um, would have been very exciting, and 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 that's what we all deserve because, you know, communities like Brooklyn, for example, don't even have reliable television. Their reception is so poor. Um, their, their phones drop out all the time and, and their internet is just a, a joke. It's um, almost impossible to have any kind of reliable service um, in that area. And that's not a million miles away from anywhere. That's um, that's Sydney suburb. That's that's Metro Sydney. Um, to have a um, an NBN that is unable to serve as me- even Metro Sydney is unacceptable. So, if the the Greens um, get more power in the federal uh, area, federal federal level of po- politics, what is going to be your take on on trying to push that forward? Are you going to remove that gag that the, the government's put on when it comes to public information around the NBN? You bet we would. And the other thing we would is we'd keep the NBN in um, public hands. The government have made plans to sell it off. Um, what but- percentage? Uh, the whole lot would be privatised. But the issue with that is that because this is a um, a half sort of a stopgap measure approach um, being taken by the government with the old copper infrastructure being relied on to some extent for, for final delivery to the home, we're going to see um, a situation where essential upgrades are ongoing and, and um, urgent so a publicly listed company that's it, that's privately held by shareholders is not going to want to undertake that work and that it, that's going to fall back on governments um, and essentially taxpayers so look to keep the um, NBN in, in public hands all the way along um, would be a much better alternative but if the government do sell it off the Greens have managed to secure um, the uh, an agreement that a parliamentary inquiry would be held to make sure that the public interest is taken into account um, before any sale decision is made. And and that brings us around to the topic of of the budget, uh, talking about you know obviously the sale of something like an NBN would be significant, uh, but obviously the, the public coffers we need to fill them with something. So. Let's just let's just bring the conversation around to the current budget that's just been um, that's been just delivered. I'm particularly disappointed with the lack of vision that the government has with regards to small business. Uh, I did a quick survey with our listeners uh, a couple of weeks ago, asking them, "Would you be happy to sacrifice the twenty thousand dollar?" And, and let's just get this straight. A lot of people think that it is a rebate. It is not a rebate. It's actually a, an, an immediate deductibility of that $20,000 capital investment that you make into your business. So if you buy a, a car that's valued at $20,000, for instance, you immediately get to write off that $20,000 in depreciation in the very first um, year that you, you have it in instead of depreciating it over time. That's it. And when I spoke to a number of small businesses, they said, look, we will be happy to, to remove that ability, the $20,000 deductibility, if it meant that we had um, a stronger NBN, for example, or if it meant that we had other investment into small business. Now, I do like what you're mentioning there about the innovation commissioner and giving that sort of investment. But I think overall, what is the Greens take on the federal government, government budget that was delivered and in regards to small business? 
Well, we didn't see anything delivered for small business. We really didn't. We saw um, big business and banks being looked after quite handsomely and we saw um, tax cuts for uh, wealthy individuals, but um, we really didn't see a whole lot of um, mentions of small business, which is just extraordinary from a government, as I said, that wants to be known for innovation and agility. We do hear that a lot from the Liberals. We do hear that, that they are the, the, the friend of small business and that they're there for them, but I, I keep on saying, okay, well, let's, that's a great rhetoric, but how about we back that up with some real hard, fast evidence or anything that you're actually doing for small business beyond a half a percent pay cut. I mean, a half a percent pay, de- uh, sorry, half a percent um, tax decrease is not really going to do much for the company tax for company tax if you're not earning, you know, no, it a huge amount. If you're no. one of those micro businesses, it's not going to really have a big impact, is it? No, that's right. Small business really does struggle to compete with the um, market power of big business, and it also bears disproportionate the administrative cost of tax collection and regulation too. So what the Greens would prefer to see is a 25% cut in company tax rates for small business. That's a very significant change. So you would see a further complication to our already insanely complicated tax system by putting small businesses into a different category to big business when it comes to the company tax rate? I think everybody knows that big business and small business operate incredibly differently. And yes, small business should be treated differently. It does. It deserves that support because, as we were talking about before, that's where the jobs are. But wouldn't that mean that the, that the onus would then fall onto the government to have more administration to control that the differential in the small business tax rate, the company tax rate, uh, the individual's tax rate, and aren't we going to have all that possible benefit sucked up by the extra jobs that would need to be had with the ATO? No, look, the focus of the government at the moment is always big business and um, the benefits to the economy as a whole by um, decreasing the tax rate for small business would um, absolutely eclipse any administrative costs of government. There's a lot of talk about bracket creep, and we obviously hear that a lot about a lot of in individual when we're talking about individual taxes and our own personal income tax. But looking at it from a company perspective, one of the arguments against uh, reducing the company tax rate into two separate categories would that you would have small business then being affected by bracket creep as well. Um, what's what's your take on that with with regards? To, wouldn't they just end up with a thirty percent in the end anyway, as opposed to a twenty five percent and the tax cut? Yeah, look, it is complicated, but um, I think. Um, like you're saying, a small business is a different kettle of fish and um, and it's terribly important for um, us going into the future that we do acknowledge um, that, as I said before, ta- uh, small business disproportionately bears the, um, the burden of tax collection arrangements and regulations. Um, and so um, dealing with ta- uh, small business separately um, will will give it a huge boost. And I think that's terribly important. But we don't get it because uh, when you look at the donors to the ALP and the Liberal Party, they, they those massive donations they receive um, at all levels of government are from big business. So it's not surprising that when we have a Liberal or an ALP um, government in power that they tend to deliver for their donors. They tend to deliver for big business because that's um, what's keeping them afloat. So I think the other thing we need to talk seriously is about and is some um, is donations reform to, um, to political parties. And the Greens are the only ones that don't accept any kind of corporate donations at all. And we also want to see a whole lot more disclosure because at the moment uh, there's a $12,500 cap um, before you have to disclose your um, uh, donors. So essentially that means if a, um, if a corporate donor wants to give um, uh, 12500 or just under that to a whole lot of different candidates, they can effectively donate up to $1.9 million, uh, $1. million while still un- staying underneath the radar of the AEC, the Australian Electoral Commission. And that system is wrong. And and wrong for and one of the most important reasons it's um, wrong um, is because it affects small business so so badly. Small businesses don't donate those massive amounts. It's big business, and that's why we see governments de- um, deliver for big business. And so, so I haven't heard that before. So what you're saying essentially is, uh, say for example, a large company could individually for each candidate around the nation for the Liberal or the Labor Party, each candidate could receive twelve and a half. $12,499. Therefore, they wouldn't have to disclose it. But as a party as a whole, they could receive up to $1.9 million if that was the case. Yeah, that is the case. 
So it's not done on a per company basis, it's done on a per donation basis. Look, some of the um, the companies like Westfield and Crown International, um, they make massive donations, so do the banks, um, and those uh, donations are disclosed, um, those hundreds of thousands of dollars are disclosed. However, they're disclosed up to 18 months after the election, after those donations are made. So um, the, the time lag is... Um, is ridiculous because it um, really increases the um, it decreases rather the transparency around these things. So we don't know who's donating to who until nearly two years after they've done it. And how does the Greens Party differ? Do they immediately disclose everything uh, publicly? Yep, on Absolutely. a website. Yes, yes. Right. All dis, uh, um, all donations uh, are disclosed, and we have a um, a ban on do, um, donations from um, corporations entirely. What's your definition of a corporation then? Something over a two million dollar turnover? No, a business. So we only accept uh, donations from individuals. So as a small business, if I'm a PTY LTD, I would be unable to to donate, donate to the Greens. even if I had a very small turnover. That's right. Right. Yep. We think that it's right and proper that uh, politics should be free of um, of influence buying because, as um, as Four Corners showed um, last week and this week, it's it's a form of soft corruption. Um, it's a it's a way of buying access and influence, um, and um, it's undermining our democratic process. And we feel very strongly that um, uh, we want to stand apart from that and call for the other parties to um, to undertake serious reform. Talk me through a very important issue, which is obviously very close to the heart of of the Greens and anybody who's got an environmental slant on the way that they they vote and their politics, climate change. Now, it's not something that you would pick as a topic for a small business radio program, but it does impact on small business. Talk me through that. It does, because renewable um, energy is not only great for, um, you know, our lungs, because we won't have to um, breathe in... um, the uh, coal particulates if you live in the Hunter or anywhere along the um, the railway line from um, the south coast up to Newcastle, like I do. Um, but it's also good for um, innovation and um, job creation. There's that word again, that word, That's innovation. Right. That's but, right. But we're, we're actually linking it to something tangible. Mm, we sure are. <laughs> I'll give you an example of how tangible it is. The other day I was talking to um, Jenny and Kevin, um, a couple of um, people who've had a, an electrical business for many years um, and who were um, doing a lot of st- solar installations. Um, and the federal government, uh, when they, um, they changed the policy to st- and, and effectively renew, removed their support from renewables, basically pulled the rug under, out from under that business. Um, and they, the, the day that decision was made, they lost two $80,000 contracts. Um, husband and wife, you know, small business um, doing great uh, and doing right by all of us by installing solar panels, um, which Australians really want on their roofs. Um, but Effectively, yeah, their business is gutted because of um, federal government policies, um, and that that's an ideological um, refusal to admit that um, climate change is happening. But it's also a um, a foolish economic decision because we're missing out on so many opportunities to um, to make some money from um, from renewables. That's exactly right. We're just going to go to a quick break. When we come back, about back onto the show we're going to talk about a little bit more about climate change and just the impact on small business around and and the economic development of our country you're listening to small biz matters on 100.1 fm we'll be back after this and you're back in the room with small biz matters here on triple h 100.1 fm we are speaking with emma hyde heidi sorry the greens federal candidate for barara before the break we were talking about a really important issue which i think does impact quite a lot on small business and the future of innovation and technology developments in this country which which is climate change. Um, we here at Triple H, or certainly me in Small Biz Matters, are a big believer in this this thing, this 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 great big enormous change that is happening to the entire world, not just to us. But let's talk about it from a micro level. Just before the break, you mentioned an example of um, a husband and wife team who were. Uh, building a business around solar panel installation and the moment that the federal government rebates were removed for that, they instantly lost um, a massive client and, and obviously had a huge impact on their business, potentially even stopping the business from continuing. But with those changes to policy, which are so fluctuating, is that the, the way we should be moving forward? I mean, where is the investment going if it's not going towards such obvious innovation and technology developments? 
So we need to have that that investment into infrastructure and to to the people, the mums and the dads who are actually building these things on behalf of the community. So what are the green? What's the greens policy? What would you change with regards to innovation investment like this and, and rebates for solar panels specifically? Yeah, well, what we change is uh, government money um, being um, offered to the uh, fossil fuel industry in the form of massive subsidies, and we'd move that across to um, support for the renewable sector. Because, um, you know, the coalition, rather than choosing to support emerging and disruptive businesses, um, they've backed the old incumbents, um, the coal and um, CSGs in industries, coal seam gassing industries. Um, so what the Greens would do is uh, wind back those subsidies and redirect them. Uh, and I'll give you a good example of exactly um, one of the programs we'd, we'd um, uh, undertake to do exactly that. Um, at the moment, the aviation and fossil fuel industries uh, receive accelerated depreciation um, discounts. So what we'd do is um, we'd stop those um, programs and we'd redirect the, that $3 billion over five years to supporting businesses and individuals in obtaining um, uh, battery storage for their solar panels because 1.4 Australian households currently have uh, solar panels. Mm -hmm. uh, we're incredibly enthusiastic and um, innovative yeah. uptakers of new technology. So massive numbers of us have got PV panels on the roof, but we can't store that energy. And look, the next biggest technology um, breakthrough is batteries. It's fantastic stuff is happening in that space at the moment. And so to drive that innovation, what the Greens want to do is take that $3 billion over five years and fun funnel that in the form of um, 50% um, tax credits to individuals and businesses who want to put batteries. Um, so the encouragement is there to, to invest in the batteries and mm, the solar panels for businesses yeah. as well as individuals. So businesses can effectively, if they choose, go off the grid. Are we talking is, about straight rebates or are we talking about uh, deductions, tax deductions for A the tax cost? deduction for the cost, up to 50% of it. Because right. we realise that, yeah, batteries are a significant investment at the moment, mm. but that the price will fall massively if there's government support to uh, for people to buy them in very, very big numbers. So that's why we see, we've and we've done the modelling, um, we've, we only need this program for five years because the same thing will happen to battery prices as has happened to solar. It will fall so dramatically that after five years of um, support and incentive, we basically won't need the scheme anymore because the price of batteries will come, uh, come down so rapidly. I think that is something something that people around the Hornsby Barara area would be very interested in. You only need to drive around to see how many people have got solar panels on their roofs. And it is, it's an, an issue, isn't it? Oh, we're now, we're now yep. sort of getting all this power in, mm. but we're not able to store it or we're selling it back at some ridiculous rate, which isn't really Pittance. viable. Yeah, 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 exactly. Look, a lot of areas around this um, this area, Annan Grove, for example, um, Dural, there's um, up to 18, 20% of houses have solar panels now. That's so huge. It's huge. Mm, it's huge, mm. yeah. Where um, and and look, people want to um want to do the right thing by their grandkids. They want to, they know climate change is um bearing down on us. They want to do something about it on a really practical, personal level, and so they want to invest in this new technology and and in the meantime um save themselves some um, money in the process too because the electricity prices are only going to get uh, go up. Coal um is m more difficult to find. We've got to dig further and further into the earth. All the all the top layer, fantastic, easy access stuff has gone um, and we've got aging power infrastructure which is expensive to maintain so if you can go off grid run your business totally um, using um, beautiful sunlight which we have a lot of here and your own um, battery pack you're sorted just to bring back to that point you were saying about the three billion dollars just so i understand this correctly that those are three billion dollars worth of um deduction incentives that are given to the coal industry currently and aviation yep and you would just switch that over to small business and individuals to give them the ability to invest in these these battery packs and further solar that's exactly right talk to me about what about wind and and i mean it's obviously not <laughs> we've really got the space here to put a wind um turbine in the middle of Hornsby uh, but what about places a little bit further out um, you know in the middle of New South Wales what's the Greens policy on wind 
powered technology and, and that innovation. Yeah, look, wind plays a, um, a pretty vital role as well. The reason we keep, keep talking about solar, though, is that um, the, the um, price of solar um, technology is coming down so fast. Mm. Uh, University of New South Wales just had a, mm. another breakthrough where they've managed to get solar panels 30% more efficient um, wow. and, and smaller as well. So um, that's where the research is at the moment. Um, wind is important and obviously if you drive to Canberra you'll see them um, on the other side of Lake George and you see those uh, see big huge great um, turbines across Europe and um, people are making money from having those um, wind turbines on their properties as well as enjoying the um, clean energy benefits but um, yeah for metro areas solar is the way to go. Talk me through the uh, coal port that's just been approved in Queensland off the Great Barrier Reef. It's, uh, Great Barrier Reef is turning into quite an important issue around the federal election. Um, a lot of the politicians are actually talking about it or they, they probably don't want to, but they're being forced into talking about it. It, it is, it, to me, a, a national disaster, what is what is occurring, um, not just from a, an environmental perspective, but from a tourism and a jobs perspective. That's right. Um, what... If, with the Greens having possibly more power in the Senate and in the in the um, House of Representatives after this federal election, what would they be pushing for with relation to the issue of the Great Barrier Reef as a whole? Yeah, um, it needs to be addressed um, through uh, climate policy because uh, we've seen massive bleaching. Basically, we've killed, completely killed, massive areas of our greatest tourist attraction mm. and our, our greatest natural natural asset. It's a World Heritage Area. Um, and um, I can't believe that we're not crying in the street about it because it, it, it's gone. Um, and to some extent you can say yes uh, areas may, of it may regrow but um, at the moment when you look at the um, rapid um, pace of um, the increase in water temperatures it's very unlikely that that um, that coral will get a significant relief of you know decades um, which is the time frame it's going to take for that coral to recover um, and like you said that's had um, you know a catastrophic impact on small business in Queensland mm. small tour operators um, it's all small scale that um, people uh, whose whose livelihoods depended on the reef and but if we're talking about jobs on. wasn't wouldn't the in, wouldn't the in, influx of oh sorry the, the building of a new coal port wouldn't that just give us another few thousand jobs Isn't yes it? it would yes it certainly would and they'd be there for a very short time Okay. It's a very, very short time frame. So we for... build it and then they, those jobs all go. That's right. Meanwhile, those yep. people who are in the tourism industry have uh, lost, lost their life. Lost their livelihood for good. Um, building a, um, a coal mine will have the same effect. Initially, there will be many jobs. Um, but the coal industry is very good at laying off people because they have a highly mechanised um, process. And Queensland coal uh, miners, we just need another 10,000 of them um, walk because um, their, their jobs are not, their jobs are redundant. They've disappeared. They've been replaced by machines. So um, coal uh, is not only bad for the planet, it's also um, bad for employment. Mm, mm, indeed, indeed. And so it is, it is an issue. I, uh, I want to stress that to the listeners that climate change is not just an issue for the climate and for the environment and for the NIMBYs. As, oh, I hate that expression. Uh, but it is actually, a, it's going to have a huge impact on, on small business as a whole all over Australia. Um, people don't come here and then go to the Great Barrier Reef and then go home. When they come here as tourists, they go to the Great Barrier Reef, they go to Sydney, they go to Melbourne, they spend their dollars, they, they enjoy the country as a whole. You're not going to schlep all the way to Australia on a 24-hour plane trip and then spend a week and then go home. You actually do quite a lot of travelling. So I think that it needs to be an issue that we all are aware of and uh, pressuring the local politicians or the, co the politicians, particularly at the federal level, to change um, those policies. Um, look, thank you so much for coming on the show today, Emma. Um, it's been great having you on the show. We'd, we'd love to hear you hear from you again uh, after the federal election, after you've got this, uh, <laughs> this big deadline off your back. Um, because it is, I think that there's a lot of... Um, interest in the local area for environment. We're surrounded obviously by the bush. We're much more in touch with our local environment than, than other sectors as well. So um, best of luck and we, we hope... Oh, no, I'm not allowed to say that, am I? The media's not allowed to say good luck. Uh, Chookers? <laughs> thumbs up. Chookers? Cheers. Thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all good. That's great. Look, thanks for joining us on the show. And, it's been um, an absolute pleasure. We wish you well. Uh, you're listening to Small Biz Matters. Thanks, if you, Alexi. If you have missed any of today's show, you can, of course, catch up with our podcasts via the smallbizmatters.com.au website. If you have a question for Emma specifically, feel free to get in touch with us on the Small Biz Matters 
Facebook page. We're happy to shoot those across to her and she can answer them for you in social media land. And also you can get in touch with us through the Triple H Facebook page also. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll see you next week, Tuesday, 9am, Small Biz Matters, the half-hour program where you work on your business rather than in it.